Imagine you're the health minister of a low or middle income country. Your annual health budget is $100. Your country faces huge health challenges and inequalities. It's your job to make sure your health funds serve the most people with the best quality health care possible. Major funders want to make sure their taxpayers' money is achieving results. You need to allocate resources where they will have the most impact. But the demands are enormous and the choices you face are complex. Hospitals are a good bet, but they're already overcrowded and can't reach those in remote locations. If you give $60 to hospitals, you only have $40 for everything else. Vaccinating children helps prevent some infectious diseases, but patients with diabetes or heart disease need treatment now. What's more, some of the population demands the latest treatments, and you face pressure from the healthcare industry. These are literally life and death decisions, and the social and political costs of failure are high. Faced with needs that far outweigh your funds, the pressure to deliver good health for the people is greater than ever. What do you do? IDSI, the International Decision Support Initiative, can help. We're a funded global network of health economics and policy expertise that gets the most out of every health dollar available. We partner with you to design health interventions that work in your specific context. We're committed to building the knowledge and skills you need to make better decisions. It's a win-win for everyone. Priority setting is at the heart of our work. We analyze the evidence, how people will be affected, and who can influence change. We look at the relative costs and benefits of interventions and the health gains and savings. We work with policymakers to ensure interventions will work long term, and we support implementation, helping countries engage their populations and put in place the systems for it to work. We know from experience that open and transparent collaboration is needed for health gains to be sustained for future generations. IDSI is unique. Drawing on the track record of the British National Health Service, we have unparalleled access to experience and knowledge from across the world. When countries can serve more people with better health care, then they can own and lead their path to universal health coverage and achieve the sustainable development goals. The funder's confident his funds are well used. And look at your health service now. You're in control and achieving more. Thank you very much for being here, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Calypso Cholkidu. I'm the um, uh, Director for Global Health Policy and a Senior Fellow here at CGD. And I'm also a Professor of Global Health Practice at Imperial College in London, where the Secretariat for IDSI is based. Um, so IDSI, oh, and I'm just about, I was just about, we had Plan B, Mark. Thanks very much for, for coming. But um, anyhow, just a couple of words on IDSI. It's a network, it's a project which was uh, thought through, incubated here at CGD about six years ago now for a working group CGD did. Um, and now we are a multi-country, multidisciplinary network of practitioners working to help turn evidence and local values into practice towards universal healthcare coverage. And of course, today it's UHC day and most people are actually in Japan. So thank you for being here and, and, and able to come together. So, Without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Mark McClellan, uh, who is going to give our opening plenary today. Uh, Mark is a very accomplished uh, doctor and economist who's really, his work has shaped US policy. He's been uh, the head of the FDA, the head of the Center for uh, of Medical Services, CMS, Medicare and Medicaid Services in the United States. Uh, he's developed policies which have influenced, of course, the United States, but also globally, um, uh, people working overseas, including in the UK uh, and beyond. And he's now the uh, Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business Medicine and Policy at Duke University and the director of the center there. Uh, he's been also with Stanford uh, and the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Treasury for Economic Policy with the previous administration. So we're very 
happy to have you, Mark. Thank you very much for being here. Um, we will then move on to having a panel discussion. So I'll ask Tony also to sit in that chair in a minute. Tony, I'll just introduce you briefly, is a professor of economics, health economics at York University, and he is the uh, founding vice chair of NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in the UK, uh, and also the chair of IDSI, this initiative we've talked about. So please, Mark, thank you very much for coming. Great to see you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you. Um, as uh, Calypso mentioned, a lot of my past work has focused on the United States. But what I want to emphasize this morning is that some of the challenges that we face here in this country are increasingly similar to challenges in uh, less developed countries, really all countries around the world, in terms of getting the most value for money in efforts to advance uh, important public health goals like uh, uh, universal health care. And I'd also like to say happy UHC Day to everyone. It's great to be part of this uh, uh, satellite meeting here in uh, Washington, D.C. as a very important goal. It's an important goal for the United States where we're struggling to get there because of health care costs. It's an important goal for even countries that have achieved something like universal health care because they are struggling with uh, making sure that the services that they're delivering meet the needs of the population, a population that can, uh, that is increasingly older, uh, increasingly facing a burden of chronic diseases, and for which the healthcare system and health technologies can do more and more. That's a good thing, uh, but it's also an increasingly uh, central problem for governments around the world. And what I want to talk about today is how some of our work at the Duke Margolis Center in collaboration uh, with organizations like CGD and many others I think is converging uh, on uh, meeting this next round of challenges in achieving effective universal health care. And that's just not getting to, to universal health care services alone and a, and a list of services that, that are should be covered, but finding that the most effective ways to deliver better health for a population, using those services, using new and innovative models of care, very often using public-private collaborations, uh, that's where our work at, at Duke Margolis is now focused and it has a very uh, global emphasis. So I'm going to talk about uh, these six topics very quickly, uh, global context, uh, a little bit of an introduction to our center for those of you who don't know it very well. Um, and then focus on where we're really um, uh, expanding our efforts around value-based approaches to delivering care, the policies, and the healthcare organizational health system capabilities that are needed to support it, and a little bit of time on uh, policy implications. Um, so uh, you all know all this is taken from a, um, a presentation that Larry Summers gave uh, uh, at uh, the, the WISH Summit, um, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, as Larry emphasized, we're seeing a convergence uh, in global health in terms of uh, reduction in child mortality. We're certainly not there yet, uh, but getting to the point where um, uh, deaths rates or under five mortality rates uh, are becoming much, much more similar around the world. And the consequence of that, this is a chart of uh, uh, leading causes of death in low to middle income uh, countries. Uh, those are shifting, as you all know, towards more of an emphasis on the stuff that's blue in this chart uh, is non-communicable diseases, uh, those mainly moving up uh, in terms of, uh, of burdens, and that requires uh, different kinds of uh, health and healthcare interventions than has traditionally been the case. Uh, healthcare spending is rising everywhere, particularly in uh, less developed countries, and we have some representatives here from uh, Southeast Asia and elsewhere, but uh, I could have put up any other uh, region of the country as well. So yes, uh, um, uh, healthcare costs are in the news every day uh, here in the United States. Uh, and in uh, uh, other developed countries around the world, but healthcare spending, starting from a much lower level, is growing much more rapidly in other countries. The reason for that is there's much more that healthcare can do than ever before, especially as countries continue to develop uh, and move into this phase where non-communicable diseases, chronic disease management, risk factor management um, are much more important uh, in population health. Um, uh, along with that, as you all know, uh, developing countries are going to be spending a lot more of their own money uh, on health care in the years ahead. Uh, and that means not just a matter of you know, finding uh, aid agencies that can help and maybe even help efficiently, uh, but really building an efficient infrastructure 
uh, within developing countries. And um, I guess my basic advice to developing countries is don't do what we're doing. Uh, there, there are better models uh, for, for doing uh, care delivery, and we're seeing those around the, the, around the world. And again, that's, that's where we're focusing a lot of our efforts now. Uh, the Duke Margolis Center really has three areas of focus. We're a university-wide program at Duke. Duke has been a long-term global um, health um, uh, participant and, and leader in initiatives. I know they work closely with CG and uh, many of the other groups uh, represented here uh, in terms of improving access to health services. Um, where we're uh, collaborating with uh, global health efforts is in these three major areas. Uh, first, uh, healthcare transformation, that is new models of care delivery that aim to get much better outcomes for a lower cost, not focusing at the service level so much as at the overall uh, healthcare organizational uh, and system level, though services uh, are important in that. Uh, biomedical innovation, uh, the major reason for increases in healthcare spending worldwide uh, over time uh, is not prices, but uh, quantities, new kinds of services, new kinds of products being available, uh, and more of those are coming. Uh, the United States, uh, a lot of debates, discussion, uh, and uh, both uh, anticipation and concern about things like uh, new gene therapies, uh, uh, potential therapies in development for Alzheimer's disease, others that can have a big impact on population health, especially for populations that are burdened by non-communicable diseases, uh, but that because they extend and improve lives uh, are likely to come, just as technologies have come in the past, at significant additional costs. So finding ways to develop and manage these technologies effectively is very important. Uh, and then we have a big emphasis on education uh, and workforce development. Uh, it turns out that the kinds of capabilities needed to lead uh, in these new uh, kind of patient-focused care models are quite different uh, than ones that uh, more siloed healthcare organizations have used in the past. Uh, in this work, as I said, we do a lot of collaboration with other parts of Duke uh, that uh, hopefully you all know well or, or, or will soon. Uh, people like uh, Mike Merson, Gavin Yamey, uh, Krishna Udayukumar, um, uh, and uh, uh, projects uh, uh, literally all around the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, India, China, um, uh, uh, East Asia, and, uh, and, and uh, other locations. Um, but again, our focus is really on getting more value in healthcare systems. And if you think about the opportunities for value, and this is something that CGD knows well, um, many of uh, much of increased value can come from helping people live longer and better lives. So effective treatments for unmet needs, very high priority for both developed and developing countries as health um, in a biomedical innovation capabilities continue to increase. Those do tend to, to raise costs. I'm happy to have some debate discussion about whether they are cost saving in the long term. Um, yes, if you uh, um, prevent Alzheimer's disease, you may uh, have uh, much less uh, downstream costs on, on things like uh, uh, chronic disease care uh, or chronic management and, and the like. But um, people do tend to develop still other healthcare problems which have their own costs. And these treatments are worthwhile, not because, primarily because they reduce healthcare costs downstream, but because better quality of life and longer life is worth a lot. Uh, it's what countries all over the world, what the, the populations want to spend uh, more money on. Uh, so, uh, as we uh, try to develop and support these new innovations, means paying increasing attention to ways to bring down costs in healthcare system. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do that. I, I've listed some of them here. Uh, these are um, uh, approaches that we think could uh, lead to much lower uh, healthcare costs, separate and apart from which specific medical technologies you, you fund or not. These are like uh, care models that rely on um, uh, big data and uh, data analytics uh, to target treatments to patients who will actually benefit. You have much more confidence that when you use uh, a costly treatment, it's going to have a a positive impact, um, shifting the way that care is delivered to be out of uh, doctor's offices and hospitals and more in, in the home, uh, using apps, using smartphone support, wireless uh, remote monitoring and the like, new team-based approaches to care, 
that uh, rely not on a physician, but maybe on community health workers or, or others that can deliver care uh, at a lower cost, better care coordination to reduce duplication of services, and very important, uh, this last uh, point uh, about integrating uh, social and non-medical determinants of health in the U.S. and uh, very er every other country that we've worked with, uh, these um, targeted kinds of services, whether it's housing assistance or um, assistance with behavioral uh, uh, issues or, or um, uh, safe, safety issues at home, um, uh, um, uh, abuse within the family, things like that can have a big impact if targeted well on healthcare costs. Uh, the problem is uh, that these kinds of treatments are usually not part uh, of social insurance or health insurance or, or, or medical types of programs. Uh, in the United States, we rely on fee-for-service payments still uh, for most services, and most of these things don't have a, a CPT code or, or something that gets them covered. Uh, in many other countries where uh, there, there are budgets for different types of services, whether it's hospital care, specialty care, uh, drugs, um, many of these kinds of services fall between the cracks. You know, they're not clearly a responsibility of one part of the healthcare system or another. Uh, and as a result, uh, because that's kind of outside the scope of, uh, of responsibilities or scope of accountability. You know, if you're focusing on hospital services, you're not really focusing on uh, social services or uh, care coordination that could provide a less costly alternative to hospital services. Um, you don't get as much investment and as much focus on implementing uh, these kinds of strategies. Uh, fortunately, there are a lot of examples of how to move beyond this. Um, this is a U.S. report that um, came out uh, earlier this year that I co-chaired along with Victor Zhao, the head of the National Academy of Medicine here. Uh, it was a big effort, 150 plus uh, uh, experts, lots of really smart people uh, uh, with uh, political experience, healthcare system experience and otherwise, that made a comprehensive set of uh, recommendations uh, that we think uh, can have bipartisan support in the U.S. that get past the debate about you know, how big should government be and how much should government spend on healthcare, how much should be spent by the private sector towards how should we really deliver health care? How should we think about health policies more effectively? Um, it uh, included a whole set of recommendations. I want to particularly focus on the pay-for-value recommendations because it goes to this point uh, that I was just making a few minutes ago. Um, all of the things on this list, uh, if you, uh, uh, you these are written for the United States, um, but uh, they reflect uh, some of the priorities that, that we've seen in our work around the world. Uh, I would uh, um, uh, posit that every single one of these recommendations could apply to other countries. We're doing a, a project now uh, with NHS and uh, uh, their vanguard uh, efforts to, to reform uh, uh, care delivery, where uh, every single one of these uh, is, uh, is part of the, uh, the um, efforts that uh, NHS is, is undertaking um, in work that we've done in less developed countries as they're thinking about how to implement uh, uh, UHC systems. Uh, they're starting to consider some of these same ideas, so start starting out not with uh, fee-for-service payments or even DRG payments, but, but payments that are really tied to uh, results at the um, uh, person and population level that uh, support the integration of medical and non-medical services that help uh, foster the development of healthcare organizations that are comfortable with, if not confident, in taking on uh, overall accountability for the health of a population or the provision uh, meeting the specialized care needs of a population. Uh, so these are, uh, I think, uh, very promising approaches, but, but can be hard to implement. Um, uh, how many of you have heard the term accountable care? <laughs> You think it's uh, overused or misused. <laughs> um, uh, this is an area where we've done a lot of work too, and um, it really, uh, for us, has been a, a good way um, for a global audience of conveying uh, what all of these pay-for-value or value-based payment mechanisms are trying to accomplish. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, from a report done uh, in collaboration with the, the WISH uh, uh, Summit. Um, we have an ongoing uh, accountable care network that, uh, that WISH helps support uh, globally. Uh, and the, the participants in, in that effort uh, uh, came up with this definition that uh, these are uh, programs, these value-based care approaches are ones in which providers are held jointly accountable for improving uh, quality and achieving cost reductions for a population. Um, this is different from the way that most 
traditional healthcare systems are set up, uh, which we call, again, this oversimplification, uh, supply-led systems where uh, payments go to individual practi practitioners, individual providers, a clinic, a hospital, something like that, who are accountable for delivering certain elements of care provided to the patients who, uh, who go to see them, as opposed to teams of practitioners who are accountable for meeting the patient's needs, uh, for getting the best health outcomes uh, at the lowest cost for a population, not necessarily people who come in to see them, uh, but accountability for a population. Um, we've uh, um, piloted and, and worked on case studies for uh, implementing these kinds of reforms in a wide range of, uh, uh, of country settings. I mentioned the UK and uh, some of the US efforts. Some of the most interesting ones that uh, we've worked with, though, are places like uh, One Family Health in Rwanda or Possible in Nepal or HealthSpring in, uh, in India where um, these are uh, countries that are much less resourced. So uh, Possible, for example, has a, a, um, a healthcare uh, spending budget of about $20 US per year per person uh, in the population that they cover. It's a very different kind of setting from um, uh, some of the US and uh, developed country settings, uh, but the principles seem to still apply. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an example of, uh, uh, of this in, uh, in, in just a minute, um, but I uh, want to emphasize that while the policy changes, which I focused on so far around payment and other policies to support this shift from a focus on services to a focus on people and populations, the policy shifts are really important, but even more important is paying attention to the capabilities, the competencies of healthcare organizations to succeed in these models. We've had a lot of challenges with accountable care in the United States uh, with uh, providers reluctant to, to really jump into these shifts in models, not because they don't want to take care of patients and focus on population health, but because that is not the way their organizations are set up. Uh, we found that the successful organizations in these models uh, need to develop a, a, a different set of competencies, capabilities. Um, this Accountable Care Learning Collaborative has uh, is one place to go for kind of more details on these resources, but if you think about the, the leadership and structure of an organization, um, having a culture that focuses not on excellence in a particular service, uh, but on um, uh, support for patients, whatever their, their needs are uh, for improving health, and having an organizational structure that reflects that, typically not organized around specific services but or, or, and, or you know, traditional lines of business, but organized around specific types of patients uh, and patient needs. Uh, finance uh, um, requires, um, uh, these uh, models typically require some new investments, not necessarily large investments at one time, but a strategy uh, around investing to build out uh, patient level care capabilities uh, uh, and tracking results longitudinally, not just what happens to patients in the facility, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, other key outcomes that will predict uh, their future uh, use of care and their future uh, health. Um, health IT, uh, again, more, more longitudinal uh, focus, uh, and then implementing care models, care pathways for patients, not just about specific services efficiently, uh, but about the overall, about uh, models that can um, deal with chronic diseases more effectively uh, and more efficiently. Um, in putting this together, um, we found that um, working with policymakers, uh, it's important to, to focus on the accountable care policy. So what population are you serving? How you, are you measuring progress since this is about uh, measurable improvements in outcomes and reductions in costs? How are you supporting providers to, to uh, take steps to improve continuously since this is not an uh, overnight set of changes? Uh, how are you changing uh, payments in the healthcare system to support those kinds of services that traditionally aren't well supported? Uh, but also importance uh, at the healthcare organizational level. So I talked about some of those uh, uh, competencies for delivering accountable care uh, before. Um, so, so that's the framework. Um, we've now done, and I would refer you, I don't have time to talk about them here, a number of case studies uh, implementing these kinds of models in a range uh, of settings, uh, uh, approaches to primary care uh, that are focused on whole population health, a focus to um, uh, reforms focusing on uh, specific diseases in some countries, uh, diabetes or uh, other particular chronic diseases or a, a lead public policy priority for getting improvements in outcomes and reductions in costs or whole comprehensive uh, uh, population-focused reforms like in accountable care organizations. 
Um, and uh, I just, uh, uh, again, uh, we, we have references cited in these slides, which we'll make available to you, um, just to give you um, one example of uh, this primary care focused approach. So uh, in rural Nepal, the traditional approach to um, supporting access to care was through funding, through public funding of, uh, of, of clinics uh, and hospitals. Um, because of the limited resources in the country, many people who lived in rural Nepal were 50, 60, 100 miles uh, away uh, from one of these facilities and also uh, because of uh, limited resources often couldn't get to uh, uh, the, the place they needed for care in time. I heard uh, stories about um, teenagers with osteomyelitis um, that, that uh, couldn't get treated and that has had chronic infections, uh, high rates of complications associated with childbirth because of limited access to prenatal care. So what the, the, the government of Nepal did in this case to adopt an accountable care model was uh, enter into a contract with a privately led organization uh, called Possible uh, where the contract was not for opening a hospital or opening a clinic and delivering some number of services, uh, but for meeting some population uh, quality of care and health outcome goals uh, for uh, this, this per capita in return for getting this per capita payment, this kind of all-inclusive payment for delivering core primary care services. So these uh, performance measures included things like um, access to uh, prenatal care as reported by patients uh, using either cell phones or uh, uh, reports to community health workers, which were the co core part of this model, uh, and measures of uh, other measures of access to care for, for chronic diseases like diabetes, for uh, acute conditions like a, a bone infection. Uh, that enabled the organization to implement a different kind of care model, kind of hub and spoke model that was much more reliant on community health workers than traditional you know, brick and mortar um, uh, um, clinics. Um, it does have a, a hospital at its core uh, for referral care, but is much more uh, um, of a community-based approach to care uh, with services delivered, uh, uh, sort of uh, education about um, uh, prenatal care, uh, education about when um, um, expectant mothers uh, and how they should go and use hospital services for delivery to reduce some uh, complications around delivery. And as we reported in a study just published in Health Affairs this past month, um, this organization was able to achieve substantial uh, improvements in all uh, of the dimensions of, uh, uh, of health uh, care quality and health outcomes for this rural uh, Nepalese population uh, while uh, doing so within uh, their overall budget. It is a kind of care model that depends on training up a different sort of team-based workforce, relying on IT to, to share information from these remote uh, villages uh, and the community health workers back to a, a central staff, uh, and uh, guiding uh, use of uh, uh, implementing guidelines for care and, and uh, uh, getting that, that care to a broader number of patients in a very different way uh, than the traditional organization of healthcare. It required, as I said before, a new kind of payment model, a new kind of regulatory oversight, a uh, new reliance on private sector partnerships in delivering care, uh, and also new kinds of care delivery models, new kinds of organizational competencies uh, to make that work. And again, we've got a, a lot of other examples of how uh, these approaches can be implemented. So uh, there are a number of implications for policymakers from this, this work. Uh, one is to uh, continue to try to embrace access to uh, valuable new biomedical innovations and to continue to support their development. Uh, but there too, um, we've been working on a lot of models for payments for new drugs and devices that integrate with these models. Payments that are not based on volume or volume discounts, but that are based on tying uh, the, the uh, biomedical products payment to actual outcomes received in populations. And in many, especially less developed countries around the world, it can make uh, uh, drug and device manufacturers a potentially more positive partner in implementing these models. Um, for healthcare organizations, um, it's not just about uh, um, uh, uh, getting into the new models, but really focusing on building the competencies and, uh, and having an orderly pathway to move from whatever capacities they have now to uh, uh, moving towards more of a, a patient focus. 
Uh, and uh, again, we see a, a significant role for the private sector in all this as well. So uh, we are on this uh, UHC day. Uh, we're very, uh, uh, we're here to, uh, in the Duke Margolis Center very much wants to support and applaud the progress that we've achieved. I think looking forward, uh, given the rising opportunities and the rising disease burden, especially for non-communicable diseases that need to be treated in models that don't look like traditional healthcare, at least in most developed countries, uh, there'll be an increasing need for these kinds of uh, models. And we hope to be able to continue to partner with all of you um, in uh, moving forward together on not only achieving UHC, but achieving UHC that really is high value continually innovating care. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to join you today. Thanks. Thanks for making, you can move the chair. Can I help? You sure? Yeah. Okay. You can wait after this, you'll just introduce where I'm at. Sure, I'll do that. Thank you. Do you want to introduce me again? Or what? Introduce yourself, Tony. Oh, well done, good stuff. So, chance to have a 10 minute question and answer. Um, Tony. Shall I go here? Or? Uh, yeah, why don't okay, you go there? I can, yeah, I'll Thanks. Go well, she said introduce myself, so Please that's. Please do, uh, yeah, I've already uh, introduced sorry, you. already an insult, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, isn't it interesting how some people can talk for an hour at you? And you come away at the end of it thinking, what have I learned? And the answer is bugger all, essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of a talk. Um, Mark talks for 20 minutes, and you're almost overwhelmed with the richness of ideas and possibilities and so on. And I, 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 you know, what we're going to, how, how we can discuss what you've suggested, Mark, is, is a, quite, a, quite a big problem. Well, I've got one, one thought on that. But first of all, I just want to say a, li a little bit about IDSI, the International Decision Support Initiative. Uh, and where it's coming from, as it were, because I think it matches up so much to uh, a lot of the things that you're talking about. Uh, it, it, I mean, there are some differences. For a start, we're an international um, network of, of partners consisting of governments and experts and physicians and managers uh, and technicians and so on, all of whom who share some fundamental um, value. So we're international, I think, probably more, it, much more than you and the Margolis Center are, right? Um, but the, th the thing we hang all our thinking and aspirations on, the peg, as it were, which we call priority setting, is really all about making, uh, creating in all countries the capacity for them to imagine futures in which their Policies have maximum impact on health. Uh, and they do it with, in, in a way that uses resources most effectively. I mean, I avoid, I avoid saying cost minimization because that, that sometimes creates wrong um, you know, vibrations. But, uh, uh, and thirdly, does it in a way that advances equity, social justice, and minimizes people's exposure to risks of all kinds, particularly financial financial risks. So our emphasis is on enabling countries to do that for themselves, right? Um, which is a little bit different from the way a lot of um, consulting and advocacy organizations operate, which is really essentially rather, rather top down. The, ex the external people come in and sort of sort you out. We, like, we hope that what we will leave behind is, a, is a, um, a, an endowment of local talent that enables people competently to do these things, solving their own problems and doing it in a bottom-up way. Now, I, those are our kind of values, and I thought they were really, you know, they weren't in any way in conflict. They're highly complementary to the sorts of things that you were talking about. And there's lots of techniques and ideas that we should share. So my, you, you, you talked about certain kinds of convergence. I would like to see um, us converging, actually, in some way. I don't know quite how it should be. But I, I, would, I would ask um, Calypso, really, to, and you and colleagues to try to find some ways in which we can work together to avoid unnecessarily overlap, but support one another and take advantage of the particular skill sets that, that you have, that we have throughout our network in order to you know, help people build better worlds for themselves. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. So can, that's, 
Can we aim at a bit of convergence? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So John. I'll, uh, I'll Thank shut you up. Thank you very much. So um, we've got a uh, few minutes for questions. Um, so we please identify agree. yourselves yeah, and mm -hmm. comments, thoughts, questions. Um, <coughs> please, yes. I've got a loud enough voice, but I'll use this as well. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm just going to, and I, you know, very much in agreement with, with what you're saying. So I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit, because many of the initiatives you talked about, and, and I'm sort of fairly familiar with some of the ones in the UK, the vanguards, the pioneers, and so on. So yeah, well, Imperial has been very involved with a lot of those. Indeed, Axel Imperial, Heimler and, absolutely. And they have some particular features where um, I think there are expectations from them that are not necessarily going to be easily achieved. Um, so, for example, some of the most successful pioneers or, or integrated uh, care examples in the UK, you know, they've been around for a long time. It's involved cultural change, yeah. breaking down of barriers, aligning financial incentives, um, and all sorts of other things that take time. Uh, and some of the efforts at uh, supporting integrated care in the UK sometimes don't come with adequate resources to, to keep them going. There is an expectation that these things will start to pay for themselves quite soon, but then we have siloed budgets and savings don't necessarily materialize very quickly. Um, and a critical issue is scale up. Um, so we can identify these wonderful examples within the UK or across the world. But what policymakers really want to know is can we scale these up? Can we genuinely make a big impact here. So uh, my question to you is, you know, this is all wonderful and good, but, you know. Pie in the sky. What next? <laughs> How do we actually make real impact out of this? Yeah, change is hard. <laughs> it is. Um, um, first of all, I want to, I know there are a lot of people here from kind of the, the less developed country perspective. And there, it, it, some of the change may be easier because if you're making big time new investments in healthcare systems, uh, I think you can rely on decades of experience in the US, the UK, other more developed countries. And again, don't do what we did or don't, don't build the same systems that we built uh, based on payment models and policies of 20 or 30 years ago, uh, but look at the innovative approaches for care. And within the UK, within the US, there are some successful models. You're right that um, in the UK, many of them had this kind of leadership philosophy from the beginning. Uh, and at least what I found in the UK is leadership really matters. If you've got um, big uh, um, regional systems um, that, uh, um, that, that don't necessarily move easily, uh, having leadership behind that can lead to um, the changes in care. As in, in the, the UK, you, you basically have to have a willingness to not only entertain these new ideas, but as I very much emphasize, shift the resources behind them. So uh, if you want to spend uh, more time and effort keeping patients out of the hospital through uh, interventions and increased uh, targeting of services and more effective services in community-based care or um, uh, ambulatory-focused uh, disease programs, uh, that does mean you know they need resources, and that means less resources somewhere else. The overall outcomes should be better, and that's something that we see in some of the successful vanguards or some of these successful new care models in uh, the UK, uh, but you do have to shift the resources. Uh, one of the big problems in England and in many other countries that have um, um, you know, these um, kind of big regional approaches to care is it can be hard to shift the resources. You know, the UK has done a pretty good job of, compared to the US by far, of keeping overall costs down. Uh, but a consequence of that is that if you're a hospital and, and you're being uh, attacked constantly for inadequate access to services and waiting lists and the like, and you see one of these pilot programs come along in a small scale that relieves the burden a little bit on your patients, uh, you say, great. Um, um, but you don't say we're going to give you even more resources. You say we're going to you know, now have the beds available to, to deal with some of this backlog that my MP is constantly uh, uh, complaining about. And it, you know, getting through that kind of leadership with le limited resources, very different situation in the U.S. where you know, we're spending too much money and we want to um, you know, basically pay the organizations that can bring down the hospital costs and so forth. So I'm not saying this is easy, uh, but I'm saying that if you want to make these systems work, 
Um, there are um, political challenges in the way as well as organizational challenges. And this is a plug, we're doing a project with the Health Foundation that will have a conference in London, which I'd love to have you all involved in, uh, around how uh, to overcome some of these uh, uh, political challenges for moving to uh, new care models in the, in the UK. Thank you. Let's take a couple more questions and then we'll take um, some closing comments from the panelists and we can move on to the next um, stage. Uh, Kuhn and Pete, I think, Pete, you had a question as well? Let, we'll start there. Uh, let's start with Kuhn, sorry. I'm confusing the microphone holders. Thank, Thank you, you, Kuhn. Uh, Introduce I'm, yourself as well, please. I'm from China. Thank you, Mac. Wonderful the presentation. In China now, we are uh, making the effort to reconstructing our healthcare delivery system. We could, uh, in Chinese term, is a tiered uh, delivery system. Uh, uh, I can see it's a coordinated healthcare delivery system. Facility at a different level have working together for uh, provide uh, care for the patient. And also encourage the, uh, the co uh, coordinated delivery system can get a payment, it's kind of a bundle payment. Yeah. And for certain conditions, my question for you, I got a lot of uh, the, the, the insights, but one question is uh, how to measure the value because they want to pay uh, the value, right? How to measure the value basic? I just got the idea, thank you. Yeah, so focusing on value and uh, China is very interesting times right now, where as you know, the, the healthcare system, the policymakers are trying to move away from you know, limited primary care and a lot of reliance on uncoordinated specialty care to more uh, well-developed primary care and, and coordinated systems. And I think the, the steps that uh, the Chinese government is trying to take are moving in the right direction. I think it would help to have some measures to, 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 to the point about value, uh, having measures of value that can be feasibly and reliably implemented. Um, all of these accountable care ideas do depend on measuring what matters and doing so reliably. Um, we've seen enough examples of applying these approaches in you know, sub-Saharan Africa, rural Nepal, that, that it is possible to, to um, uh, I think, anywhere uh, to come up with an effective uh, measurement system to support uh, healthcare organizations that are moving more to value, um, but uh, each country has its own uh, uh, institutional issues. And in, in China, uh, finding ways to rely on uh, consumers for, for reporting on, on quality of care. Um, uh, there's some very interesting private sector models that are you know, maybe not necessarily available to low-income rural Chinese, but that um, uh, people with more means, more of the middle class are, are, are buying now that are this kind of coordinated care that rely on you know, apps that they can use from home to check on their health and, and that they are paying for on, on kind of an all-inclusive, you know, sort of per member, per month basis. We've seen some of the same things in, in India uh, and elsewhere. Um, and one of the challenges for governments is finding a way to, to work with the, the private sector in implementing the, these approaches, maybe by uh, subsidizing the organizations that actually do better on reliable measures of accountable care um, rather than uh, trying to um, uh, design and, and run a system entirely themselves. <coughs> um, I'm actually going to be in Beijing uh, next month uh, to have some meetings about this and would be very glad to, to, to follow up with you on um, um, some of the unique uh, features of the, the Chinese healthcare system in, in trying to move to to more accountability for results. Well, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Certainly, we'll make the connection. It'll be very valuable. Mm -hmm. Last question. Pete, did you have a point? Well, I'll only make my question if there's no one else, because Imperial College has been a bit uh, <laughs> uh, overrepresented. Is there anyone else who wants to? Go ahead, Pete. OK, well, thank you, Mark. Uh, excellent as ever. Um, I, I just want to press a little bit on the technological <coughs> development and uh, new technology and the role of that. Um, I've been involved in a number of projects across Europe where um, uh, communications technology of one sort or another has been introduced to make consultations remote, easier consultations and generally bring healthcare uh, closer to the patient. Um, and they've each been, without exception, um, quite good at improving patient satisfaction, uh, quite bad at improving outcomes, neutral, that is, 
and an absolute disaster on expenditure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder whether, and, and so many policymakers are really scared, very scared about new technology yeah. and, and such. So I wonder what, um, what your thoughts are and how you can square that circle. And both, in, one of your arrows is new technology and so yeah. on, but the, the other one of controlling costs and... Well, uh, I think it's a great question. I think this would be a great area of further collaboration with IDSI, too, given all the, the work that um, IDSI has done on um, understanding uh, value of interventions and, and their um, implications in, in particular kinds of uh, care settings and, and populations. Um, I, I guess it, just a, a short answer is that um, paying for new communication technologies in the same way that we've paid for other technologies traditionally, um, I think the evidence is very limited that that will ever save, um, ever reduce costs. We've had that experience in the United States. We spent $20 billion plus on uh, IT initiatives, uh, on our so-called meaningful use initiatives here, which did a great job of, of getting hospitals equipped with electronic health records and in some ways making it easier to connect to patients, but did a really good job of facilitating more fee-for-service billing, um, where the technologies have, that the information technologies have made a bigger difference is in organizations that start from something like the models that I was talking about before, where uh, you're not focusing on paying for the communications technology, but you're giving the organization something more like a fixed amount of resources, or if not, at least some of their resources that are tied to uh, overall results and reducing costs, and then giving the, them the flexibility to spend those resources on the kinds of communication or other technologies that can help achieve that now explicit goal. And uh, what we found here in the U.S. is that investment in high-tech uh, kinds of EHR systems is much less important to success on actually achieving better outcomes and lower costs in the short terms than getting like basic information. Just to give you one example, there was a um, group of practitioners in, in Florida that wanted to succeed as an ACO, a group of uh, primary care physicians. And instead of spending a, much, a bunch of money that they did not have on electronic record systems that would allow uh, them to, to track a lot of data electronically and, and might someday connect to other healthcare organizations, they made a list of the patients who they thought would be most likely to show up in the emergency room in the next 30 days uh, or die in the next year. And they gave every single one of those patients a cell phone number that connected them to one of the doctors directly at any time 24-7. And that what they told the patients was, look, if you have an urgent health problem, don't call the emergency service lines for the ambulance and so forth call us personally, and we will deal with it. So it's an IT system that, that connected the patients to the doctors, uh, much lower cost, but, but got, you know, was targeted well and, and enabled uh, uh, communication and, and interventions around preventing hospitalizations, around managing emergency department visits that just wasn't possible before. Uh, in that rural India, uh, sorry, that rural Nepal example that I talked about, uh, they invested in some cell phones for their um, community health worker staff so they could uh, text in uh, key information about at-risk patients, get them in a, a central cloud-based, uh, uh, very simple uh, electronic record system and connect them to uh, some care guidelines for improving access to, you know, so it led to follow up on patients who were pregnant and uh, follow up on patients who had, like, you know, that, that girl that I was talking about earlier with osteomyelitis, she had a, a community health worker that came to her, brought the antibiotics, enabled her to be treated at home and got well. Um, those kinds of simple targeted IT interventions are what we need much more of rather than just kind of a blanket investment uh, in, in hopes that a particular IT technology will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That's really fascinating. So we're running a bit late, so I, will, I would like us to close this panel, ask yeah, Tony yeah, to... Yeah. Would you like to say a few words, Tony? And no, <laughs> no. I mean, I, the, the, the only reflection... <laughs> just very quickly, the only reflection I have is that so, so many of the issues that confront us are actually uh, areas that are largely evidence-free. I mean, the, 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 most, the biggest yeah. of all is... A, a tackling culture change, how to how to effectively to, uh, to change the culture of an organisation which uh, which c causes harms, hurts, and uh, and is uh, difficult for people who lose, uh, and uh, I mean that is that's a huge huge issue that I think if, 
I mean, when I remember when we were setting up NICE, we were sort of amateurs at all this sort of thing, but we were involved in a very major uh, culture change, which was hugely helped by the fact that we were building NICE on the back of a couple of major uh, medical clinical scandals, mm -hmm. uh, which had demystified a lot of the, uh, you know, the, I'm a doctor, you know, sort of, uh, it's okay, sort of stuff. Um, uh, uh, but we were very, very much open to the risk of uh, creating a new institution that was a, a, a labor, a socialist institution. Uh, so you could imagine that was immediately vulnerable to a change of government, for example. Uh, and so we, we, we spent, we, in our amateurish way, spent an awful lot of time making sure that the opposition parties were on side and understood what we were about, as a result of which NICE survived several changes of government. So, um, but how you protect, how you protect uh, innovate, worthwhile in innovative changes um, as once, you, once you've overcome the problem of initiating them, I think a big problem is that uh, I, uh, you know, perhaps we, learn, we can learn together a good deal about uh, in the future. So Fantastic. hope so. Right. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you both. Thank you, Mark. Thank you Really all. appreciate your time. Great. Great to have you. So we're going to move on now to um, a short presentation by uh, key members of our network. And of course, the Thai colleagues, HITAP has been a founding member of um, IDSI for um, since the very beginning and before that. There were members also of the CGD Working Group. And I would like to welcome Urania as the head of HITAP's international unit and a valued colleague to give a uh, presentation. Thank you, Rania. Thank you, Calypso, for the introduction. Today, I'd like to share you all about our work as part of the IDSI network to build research capacity on priority setting um, for UHC and in Asia. <laughs> um, Today, universal healthcare coverage is a global agenda and a commitment. We all seen that many efforts have been made in order to help countries to make the progress and to achieve the universal healthcare coverage. However, there are still some challenges um, for low and middle income countries. Um, from our experience working with uh, many developing countries in Asia, we found that um, here are the list of the, their challenges. The first one is about the lack of the systematic process to making a decision on whether which intervention should include in the benefit packet. And the second one is they have generous um, benefit packet. For example, we're working in Vietnam and how can you imagine that more than 20,000 medicines are listed in the benefit packet without any restriction on the use of the medical indication? And this is lead to the problem in Vietnam, and I am going to present in detail in, in the next following slide. And the next one is about they have also insufficient use of the healthcare resort. And the last one is they um, some countries, they have a problem with the transitional to, from the international support or donor, for example, Gavi um, vaccine, that, uh, for the vaccine that provide um, from Gavi. And this is why um, HITAP and ADSI, we try to build and promoting the evidence-informed decision-making. And we try to translate the knowledge or the guidance at the global level into the current practice and implementation. And we try to build country capacity building on health technology assessment because we believe that this is an important tool to help um, the increase in sub, um, to develop the benefit packet to more efficiency. And the last one is uh, we also try to strengthening the HTA collaboration at the national level and regional and also global level. And here is the first um, interesting showcase from our work. We work in Vietnam, as I mentioned earlier, that there are more than 20,000 medicine lists in the benefit packet and only 13 medicine accounting for um, more than one third of the drug budget that, that they are currently spending on annually. And this is, um, this is why health minister in Vietnam, they, um, he has very concern on this and request IDSI to provide support to revise the benefit packet. We cannot review the whole list and we set priority by um, review the first 13 top priority medicine that they're currently um, spending on. And we did lit literature review and we tried to make a list 
where um, the indication um, whether they have evidence to support on both clinical and economic um, evidence to support the use of the indication for those particular medicine. And on, on your right hand side, you can see this is the table of result presentation that we try to simplify the key message and the key finding of the research in order to help minister and people who don't uh, have the technical background to understand that we try to save um, the but we try to save the budget here that um, those indications that they don't really have the clinical um, benefit and they don't have a they don't have the good value for money to use of those medicine on the yellow the the light yellow and the um, dark yellow and also the red one and here is the finding um, on y axis you can see the health class um, spending in Vietnam and the x axis is the list of 13 medicines that we review and more than half of the spend spendings um, current spending goes to the medicine that they are in appropriate use and we present to the health minister and to see whether um, how much they can save um, from the inappropriate use of the medicine and the second um, um, case study as is in Indonesia um, for the use of insulin. We all know that there are lots of evidence to support that there is only minimal clinical benefit um, over the use of insulin analog compared to the human insulin. But you can see currently in Indonesia, more than 99% use um, human insulin. Um, because there is no restriction, both of insulin listed in the benefit package. And clinician can freely um, choose whether they want to go for insulin analog or human insulin. And for sure, they want to go for um, insulin analog because they believe that, um, that that might be better. And another reason is the price. You can see the price um, of human insulin and insulin analog is not much dif different compared to Thailand. Here is the Thailand. He, insulin analog is much higher um, cost compared to human insulin. And also, we in Thailand, 94% we use human insulin analog. So this is, um, we try to estimate, they have the current budget used for insulin only is about 18 million USD per year. And we estimate and tell the governments of Indonesia that if the first scenario, if they clearly, if they try to um, allocate the use of human insulin more than insulin analog um, at the same percentage of Thailand. They can save 8% um, of the current budget. And the second scenario, if they just use human insulin analog at the current practice, but um, adopt the Thai price, so they can save 60% of the current budget. And the last scenario is the ideal that we want them to implement in the Indonesia, that they use human insulin human insulin 94% um, at the um, price in Thailand, and they can save 89% save of the current budget. So the next few more minutes, I would like to show you the people who are actually behind the scene. All the work that I present to you is not done by me or done by HITAP, but done by local people. And I, we ask them to share their experience on how they're working on the priority setting activity and how they're working with Ideas I Network. So can you please show the video? building is necessary for every country. So we need to 
signal support from the countries with experience in doing FTA. So we should like really aware about the finance budget like a limited research in our country so HTA is very important but we need like some critical mass to make uh, this process better we want to have like an evidence-based uh, policy uh, decision-making but unfortunately at the moment we, we do not have enough Evidence to convince uh, and evidence to uh, strengthen the policy recommendation. Uh, the support from international organizations, for example, IDSI and HITAP, is very important for us. Uh, we can learn from them not only the methodology but also like soft skill, how to working with policymaker. Because similar to basically what every country who uh, committed to realize universal health care is now experiencing, my country, a low middle income country, is also faced with numerous public health concerns and issues. In order to get the good health in Bottom views, uh, we we should have a good uh, government governance, like good uh, policy maker, good policy, good regulation, uh, capacity infrastructure. HTA plays an important role in ensuring that there will be a mechanism within the ministry or within the healthcare system that uh, will help facilitate prioritization towards achieving universal health care. Conduct the real economic evaluation and it's different with like the data. You know, the in data in low middle income countries is very challenging and we try to build uh, assessment for uh, health technology and uh, I think have that supervise and give us uh, very good technical assistance. Is the value of HTA being a multidisciplinary and how it gives emphasis on bringing all these important expertise all together in order to generate a holistic, comprehensive and extensive evidence that can guide and inform decision making and most importantly how high value this technical expertise is in achieving universal health. Thank you for the opportunity that I got selected for next year's uh, internship at the HITAP. HITAP design professional. They are also very friendly and now we are not only like working partner but we are also close friends of each other. So with that, thank you HITAP and thank you IDSI. Cảm ơn IDSI and HITAP. So maybe my last um, message that um, you can see from the video that is not um, our focus as part of the IDSI is not focusing on building research or technical work, but we try to build local capacity um, for the sustainable USC under the Sustainable Development Goal. Happy USC Day. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to introduce Professor Kenneth Hickey from Prices, who is another um, founding partner, major partner of our network, and he's going to give us an <coughs> overview of South Africa situation. Thank you, Okay, Karen. so here we go. Mention the red color. Okay, so you might ask um, why we uh, are talking about sugary beverage taxes on UHC Day. And it really makes a lot of sense. Okay, it's an upstream issue um, and it's going to save money. And it's a best buy for health. As the Minister of Health in South Africa says, he is the Minister of Health. He's not the Minister of Health Systems. So while Priceless does 
as part of IDSI, focus on health systems and HTA. Today, I want to talk about fiscal levers to address non-communicable diseases. So here we have Latabo. Latabo is 20 years old. He's HIV positive. And he's drinking one or two sugary beverages a day. Okay, It's increasing his uh, risk of diabetes type 2 by 25%. In fact, it is the liquid sugar that's the issue. Okay? Having a donut is not the same as having a Coke. And as a result, he, is now, he now has HIV and diabetes. In South Africa, uh, a huge uh, percentage of people who are HIV positive, 20% actually, are now over the age of 50. Many of them have high blood pressure and diabetes. So we've got these two colliding epidemics. And uh, we've got a very, very high Gini coefficient. We've got 55 million people, a 27% unemployment, and actually it's closer to 70% in rural areas. And we've got a public health system that is spending uh, it serves 84% of the public and is spending $250 per capita and a private sector which is serving 16% uh, uh, and, and costing, uh, paying $1,000 per capita. So the health expenditure of GDP is both the public and the private sector here um, of about 10%, but we are getting a really poor bang for our buck. The maternal mortality, the neonatal mortality, uh, and the life expectancy have not kept up with our peers in Mexico, Brazil, uh, Chile, and other places. So uh, one of the projects that we've done has looked at fiscal policies for health in South Africa. So using a fiscal lever, how can we improve health in South Africa? And South Africa has been a leader in tobacco policies. 20, 25 years ago, South Africa introduced a tobacco tax. The tobacco rates have dropped by half. Okay? That was the stroke of a pen. It wasn't just the taxes. It was a bouquet of, of issues, which included you know, not smoking in public places, uh, decreasing marketing, stop marketing to children, but we know that alcohol, tobacco, and sugary beverages are all in the same category. So I want to talk to you today about my favorite topic, which is sugar. Okay. And we, have, we were engaged with policymakers. This is the previous but one uh, uh, Minister of, of Finance, uh, Pravin Gordon who was announcing this at the budget speech. And we have very close uh, connections to the policymakers in South Africa as part of our IDSI uh, priceless network. And um, I just want to show you that uh, there's a lot of things that have already happened in South Africa. We have trans fats regulations. We have, as I said, tobacco taxes. Uh, priceless was very involved with getting salt regulations to uh, have limitations in processed foods and bread. And um, the sugar tax was announced in 2016. We started this evidence-based work uh, in 2013. And it's been a journey, let me say. Um, so we needed to translate that evidence into policy. And how did we do that? We've got a huge obesity problem in South Africa. This is happening in rural areas. This is happening in urban areas. 25% of teenage girls in rural areas are overweight or obese. South Africa, and I don't like to say this, but I, I will tell you, we are number two in the world for nine and 10-year-olds who consume sugary beverages. Okay? The first country is Mexico. And there are rising sugary beverage sales. We did a, a, an assessment of energy drinks, which contains even more sugar than sugar, the standard sugary beverages, marketing to young teenage boys. It is going on. The, the companies have said that they want to target 
Sub-Saharan Africa, that is their growth market. They know that you guys in the global north know all about these issues, okay? But they think that people in Africa are stupid, okay? So they have said, we are going to target Sub-Saharan Africa, and more amazing, we are going to target the poor. Okay, so they've said that publicly, amazing. Um, so we did a lot of research. We've published dozens of papers on the impact of sugary beverage taxes, how it would affect diabetes, obesity, stroke. Uh, we've looked at what I think is really important, the cost of inaction, so of not doing anything. So instead of decreasing the number of obese people, the number of obese people just continues to climb. Um, and um, we engaged with policymakers and very importantly with the media. We get calls all the time from the press, from the television, from the radio uh, to talk about this work. This is us demonstrating outside parliament uh, on one of the many occasions where we uh, talk to um, both policymakers, parliamentarians, there was treasury workshop after treasury workshop. The industry obfuscated and interfered at every possible spot. And let me say, they're still doing it. So the parliament has now passed the sugary drinks tax in, in December this year. Okay, it's now December. It's happened a couple of weeks ago. But the president still has to sign this. And when the president has signed this, then I will take up the champagne. Um, there are lots and lots of challenges that we encountered and will continue to encounter. As we've seen in Mexico, even when the tax was passed in Mexico, the, uh, they tried to undo it, to undo the tax. Uh, the people, the investigators in Mexico who produced the local evidence, which is what we did, very important, have received death threats. Five of them have received death threats. This is no joke. Okay. Um, there's biased research being generated. I'm sure you've read all this information in, in the newspapers here. It is ongoing. People are paid millions of dollars to, to generate research that is, in, is obfuscating the fact that sugar is bad and what sugary beverages do, et cetera, et cetera. They like to create controversy. And of course, the media buys into that. Okay? So I spend a lot of time, and my colleagues who have done a lot of this work, spend a lot of time trying to deal with that, which distracts us from what we should be doing. Um, they sponsor lots of sport events. They have very creative rhetoric. Okay. I think Coca-Cola has the best marketers in the world. They are fabulous. We have no idea. It's just amazing. We, we sit and we do these little things, backgrounds. We should be learning how to do marketing. Okay, They shift the blame. You shouldn't be drinking. It's not actually about the, the sugary beverages. It's about the other things that you eat. A calorie is a calorie, just exercise. No concept that, not no concept, they do know, that sugar, it's the, the liquid sugar that's so really terrible. And it is true. There was a, an article, I think, in this morning's New York Times about how, the, how NAFTA uh, has opened Mexico to becoming an obese country. Okay? All these trade agreements, there is, in South Africa right now, is McDonald's, uh, Burger King, KFC, that people are just flooding into the country, okay, because they know that this is an emerging economy where there's just a little bit of extra money, the food is really cheap and terrible, and with all of this food comes a sugary beverage. So they shift the blame, they, they tried to delay this multiple times and succeeded in delaying things. Heavy, heavy marketing. Um, but this is what it looks like in South Africa. This is what's happening. And they have focused on the jobs. The tax could result in a loss of 70,000 jobs. So there were 70,000. Then they did another study. It took down to 50. Then they did another study. It took down to 20,000. 
we were now down to about 2,000 jobs. Okay? But they're still talking about the jobs, still to this very day, and it's a better way, let us work with you. We need an engagement between government and business. Um, the largest contributors are the other calorie-rich foods. They had breakfast meetings, they had meetings, they accosted me at meetings, they tried to get hold of me. I've said, I've published everything in the literature. Please, enjoy, it's there. Um, it, it, it's really no joke, and they are saying that they're empowering women by giving them business skills. It's a very complicated landscape. And what I really learned from this is it's not about the evidence at all. I was horrified. Okay, absolutely horrified. Here we all are. We believe in evidence, better decisions, blah, blah, blah. It's about politics. The sugar industry, as just an example, submission for public comment, no scientific basis to claim that sugar is an unhealthy food, most foods would probably be unacceptable for human consumption if it weren't for the addition of sugar. And I'll tell you something, they're right. Just to give you an example, cranberry juice. Okay, Cranberries are so bitter and sour, you can't imagine. We are glugging cranberry juice like water. Okay, Because they've put sugar in it. Okay, We did some studies in, in Soweto, uh, transforming uh, area near Johannesburg. Uh, in the primary schools of Soweto, 50% of them have a, a, a board that is advertising Coca-Cola. They have now said that they have sent a letter to every principal of every primary school in the country, they said, to say that they will no longer sell these beverages. Well, it's a natural experiment, so we'll check that. Okay, so they want voluntary pledges. They pledged eight years before we did the study that there would be no marketing to children. Can we trust these people? I don't think so. It's also very interesting to me in South Africa what's happened. There's a change in tactics. So in a lot of countries where this is going on, and it's going on in a lot of places, okay, including in the United States in several cities and counties, the Cook County tax was uh, rebuffed. They've got rid of it. Um, but in many places, it's been successful. And just this morning, I think they're going to pass one in Montreal. But usually, they focus on the public, getting the public to change their minds. What happened in South Africa was we did some studies uh, that actually showed that the public were in favor of the tax. Once they realized what was going on, they became in favor of the tax. 75% of South African public actually support this tax. They would like the tax to be earmarked and used for health. And it's, it is a difficult issue because the South African Treasury doesn't like to earmark for all sorts of other reasons. But it, it really is an important thing. And they have said repeatedly they don't have enough ma money for NHI, for universal health coverage. And they will, I think, you know, the money's fungible, so they will use the money for other purposes. But really, what is quite horrifying to me was this, the lobbying of key policymakers. Now, I know this is not news to people in the United States, but in South Africa, there isn't a, uh, there isn't a tradition of lobbying policymakers. And so it was fascinating to watch this whole experience including the fact that the head of the Finance Committee in Parliament spoke out about this the next day. The night before the tax was to be passed, he received a call from the head of the beverage industry saying, you should dump this tax. I can tell you story after story after story. This one is just amazing. This is my last rant for the day. Um, this is from Bev South Africa's presentation. This was to the National Council of Provinces, which is the lower house in South Africa. So there's an upper house and a lower house. This is their scenario. Really incredible. There's going to be increased unemployment, leading to gender-based violence, family disintegration, rising social grants, and an increase in crime. Please. Just amazing. So this business of the industry harassing and threatening politicians uh, is part of 
other stuff that is going on in South Africa right now, um, where there has been interference with state capture. And I think that it's part of a general feeling about the country that people are susceptible to being uh, corrupted. Not everybody is. Uh, let me say that they had an impact. Okay. Uh, the industry caused a significant weakening of the tax, which was changed. The name was changed to be called a health promotion levy. And it reduced the tax from 20% to about 12%. Will it work? I think it will still work. It would be better at 20%. Uh, in Mexico, it's 10% and it's had a, it's a, had a huge impact. And it is regressive in terms of being a tax, but it is progressive for health. So what are the lessons that I've learned? As I said, it's not about evidence. It's about the political economy. I mean, the evidence, let me say, the evidence was very useful. We used that as the beginning of the discussion. But really, at the end of the day, they weren't persuaded by that. Um, as I said, confronted with sales drop in the global north, increased uh, marketing to emerging economies, especially the poor, the local evidence, and strong advocacy support. This T-shirt, okay, and those uh, things outside Parliament were very important. Okay, there were paid ads. Things went on in terms of advocacy. I can't tell you that we did this on our own. Okay, I do think this is important. So, tobacco, sugar. Um, and alcohol are the same thing. As uh, there's just a new report that's come out, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, uh, sorry, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, okay? And I think that's where we are. Okay, we don't need to be fooled again. We've d been through this with tobacco, and we don't have to go through this again with sugar, I don't think. And I think we need to wise up, I can tell you, you could replace the word sugar for tobacco. It's identical. I personally work very closely with the head of the National Council Against Smoking in South Africa, key civil society group. And it was, he said to me, he used to call him at all times of the day and night, and he used to say, do not worry about this. We've been through this exactly before. So thank you very much. I think it's just a small little idea, um, but I do think that on this Universal Health Coverage Day, it's very important to consider other ways of improving health, and this is an example. Thank you very much. Thank you, and now, Amanda, over to you. Evidence matters, though. Evidence matters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Okay, thanks for sticking with us. We'll wrap up now. I won't talk very long, but this is just to tell you about um, what work we as the Center for Global Development did as part of this network of um, health economists and health policy specialists that are working to promote value for money uh, as one strategy towards uh, achieving universal health coverage. So um, one question is, what is UHC? I think it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Politicians everywhere promise it. Everyone wants it. It's supposed to be all the health services you need, all the health possible, alongside protection from impoverishing out-of-pocket spending on those services, medicines, interventions. So that's a tall order. And inevitably, we ask ourselves whether this is just an, inspira an aspiration, a beautiful dream. Is it? Because in low-middle income countries, public budgets for health are growing but they are growing from a very low baseline, and they are growing very slowly on average. So for example, in 2014, Malawi had about $50 to spend on each of its citizens. Ghana has $87 and needs to cut due to commodity and foreign exchange fluctuations. Honduras has $200, and China about double. Aid actually doesn't add more than a couple of dollars per person to spend in most countries if it's still around at all, because these countries are growing enough that they are graduating from those aid subsidy windows. In the US, we spend about $9,400 per person. So I think that puts the resource constraint into stark contrast. 
And yet in the United States, just as in Malawi, in Ghana, in China, we have to make choices about how we spend those very scarce resources. One option is to continue with inertial res resource allocation. What do we mean by that? That we send input-based budgets to states and municipalities or to provider groups or to insurers and we hope for the best. We go down a very easy political path of implicit rationing. First come, first served until the money runs out or just following the latest priority or advocacy group that shows up in the minister's office. But that has some big downsides, inequity. So one example, in South Africa between 1988 and 2003, white patients were more than four times more likely to receive dialysis than non-whites. That's a clear, that's unfair, and it feels unfair to people as well. But there are also opportunity costs. Now, we all want to provide as much as we possibly can, but we have to recognize if we are going to advocate for certain kinds of treatment that may have some cost associated, that means we're providing less of something else that may be more health producing. And I think all of us, whether we're sitting in Washington or Boston or in Accra, we have to be cognizant of whatever we advocate for. Actually, our voices have quite a bit of power. Decision makers hear them, patients hear them, evidence is global and they're gonna want coverage. People want coverage for things that are gonna help them, and that is completely normal and desirable. But without a process by which to choose what we're gonna publicly subsidize, to do it in a fair way, in an evidence-based way, we're going to lose the chance to improve health for the most people possible. So that's what this book is really all about. It's about designing health benefits in a way that is sensible in a way that is fair, that is evidence-based. And we talk through um, the, the ways that that can happen. It's much more than a list of high-value interventions, products, or devices. Uh, it's the set of enabling policies and processes around that list, okay? So uh, Karen very rightly talked about politics, about interest groups. Uh, when we see something like uh, Indonesia, where insulin analogs are being reimbursed by public monies, you have to ask yourself, what's going on here? Well, it's the lack of a process. It means that if, I'm a, if I had the last uh, chance to talk to the minister or someone in power in, in terms of procurement, I might choose those products without any further consideration. So it's about setting up a process, about having rules of the game, and hopefully that helps all of us. If, if I, as industry, know that I can get a product or a device reimbursed or paid for by the public monies, if I can meet a certain cost-effectiveness threshold, or I participate in a process, or I provide evidence that's good enough, I think that's good for all of us. It means competitive markets. It means high-value care. And that's what the health system should be moving towards. So I'm not going to go uh, into any more detail since we're at time right now, but just encourage you to Take a look at, at the book. We're thinking about other ways we can get this information out there. Uh, the book has three parts. One is about governance, process, monitoring and evaluation, budgets. A second part that's about different kinds of methods to use, not just cost effectiveness, but plus, plus, plus. Uh, and then a final section that looks at political economy, ethics, and legal considerations. And it provides specific examples of what different countries around the world have done or not done mistakes that have been made, and uh, big hits that have been achieved. Some of those countries are sitting here today. Obviously, Thailand is an inspiration for all of us, that they use health technology assessment to inform the listing of benefits in their national health security system. And uh, we'd like to see that, I think, more in other parts of the world. So thank you so much for coming out today. Enjoy your UHC day. Uh, go, uh, you know, don't have any sugar. <laughs> No tobacco, but you can enjoy a visit to your physician or a physician's assistant. Okay, thank you very much. Leave your. This little one needs a vaccine to protect her from a deadly disease. This grandfather of five needs emergency heart surgery. What if you could only pay for one? How would you choose? Imagine making that decision for a whole country. How would you allocate public resources? 
to do the most good? Many low and middle income countries face this question. They want to give their populations essential health care, but they have limited budgets. So we ask dozens of health experts, how can countries decide what's in and what's out? This is what we learned. Consider the system the decision will rely on. Consider the evidence on what's been done before. Identify constraints and develop solutions. Then create or update your health benefits plan. This process can help you prioritize the benefits that are vital to your community in ways that are cost-effective, evidence-based, fair, and sustainable. What's in, what's out? Designing benefits for universal health coverage. Find out more at cgdev.org slash health dash benefits.